What up? It is I, your proverbial boy, Jeffy. I'm here today in San Francisco, and today I want to share with you a very vital fact about life that, quite frankly, I wish I had learned a lot earlier. So as the oh-so-profound Joker meme goes, we live in a society, and that society is populated by, quite frankly, cretins, imbeciles, haters, and I guess for lack of a better term, trolls. So, you know, as you go through your life and you encounter these people, in a best case scenario, they inspire some mild amusement on your part. Like, oh, look at this little person. What a shame. But, but in a worst case scenario, they can actually ruin your entire life. Now, one thing that I always say is you got to come to a realization that it's okay if some people don't like you, right? It's okay. But of course, the corollary to that is it better be okay because some people definitely aren't going to like you. So having said that, I think before we dive in here, it's important to acknowledge that human beings are not in fact all bad. Okay, we're not all these troll troglodytes trying to destroy each other in a cave. You know, when we are displaying our highest characteristics, we're capable of some amazing things. We can be interdependent. We can be compassionate towards one another. We can be generous. We can be supportive, all that great stuff. However, the fact remains, each and every one of us is on our own journey. And you've got to recognize that some people are just in a different space in their lives. And these people may wish to bring you down. Not everybody likes you and not everybody wants to see you succeed. In fact, some people are straight up hoping that you fail. And these might even be people that are close to you. They might be your coworkers, colleagues. They might be relatives. They might even be people that you consider to be your friends. And the reasons that they have for harboring these resentments might be totally false. They might be based on a misunderstanding or they might just be totally made up in their heads. And beyond that, you, then you've got people who are just kind of wired wrong, so to speak. People who just want to mess with you because hurting other people amuses them. You know, you probably heard of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Well, once all the survival needs are met, then you get to the final need for self-actualization. And some people might want to self-actualize by pursuing their dreams of becoming a painter. Whereas other people might want to self-actualize by pursuing their dreams of becoming a serial killer. Right? The... Uh, you know, the expression of self-actualization in humanity runs, runs the entire gamut of behavior. And, and beyond that, you know, you've also got the old crabs in a bucket, the, the, the tall poppy gets cut mentality. And what that means is whenever you attempt to rise above the status quo, basically you're putting a target on your back. You might have heard that phrase, the first million is the hardest when it comes to you know, financial success. Now, when I heard that back in the day, I used to take that at face value, meaning the hardest part of becoming wealthy is acquiring $1 million, right? And as I gained more success myself in that realm and I started to you know, surround myself with people who were, who were quite wealthy, I learned that the meaning goes a little bit deeper in that, number one, once you kind of crack into that higher strata, that higher echelon, there's a lot more complexity in terms of how you're saving and investing that money. You know, you're probably just not putting it in a your, your B of A checking account, right? You know, you got to learn how to diversify and figure out different tax codes and tax shelters, blah, 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 blah. But beyond that, when you acquire a lot of wealth now, you very often become a target for scammers, for thieves, for lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't matter how you made the money. You could invent this life-saving device that saves a million lives a year and that's how you made the money but it doesn't matter no matter how pure your motivations might be someone's going to try to pick them apart and they're going to try to bring your ass down you know they're going to investigate your history looking for ammunition to use against you they will even mock your physical appearance <laughs> you know anything that they can use to kind of chip away at your confidence they consider that fair game you know back in the day i remember uh when i used to Re, really engage with the YouTube comments. You know, there's that old saying, never read the comments, but you know, I used to read every single one and he, read the troll comments. And my favorite comment from back in the day was, I hate this motherfucker. He looks like a fucking bird. Like what? I look like, do I look like a fucking bird? 
<laughs> you know, that's when I first started kind of gaining, gaining a following on YouTube. But I, one thing I learned very quickly was this. Any engagement whatsoever with haters and trolls will simply escalate it, right? It, it will just, it's going to escalate it. And this is a basic part of the psychology of conflict, right? Intellectually, you may know very well that, oh, if I escalate, it's going to, if I engage, it's going to escalate it. However, there's that lower brain, you know, that kind of emotional brain, the monkey brain, if you will. It's like, I don't care about that. I just want to win. I just want to get the last word in. I want to be right. And, you know, I could talk a lot more about this, but I think it's kind of beyond the scope of this particular video. So we can kind of put a pin in that one for the future. But to give another example, you know, say that you see someone you disagree with on Facebook or somebody posts, you make a post and somebody posts under your post, like some, again, hatery comment and you start to argue back and forth with them. Are, do you really believe that you're gonna change anyone's mind on Facebook? Hell no, right? So it's important to understand that haters, they need to find a target that responds to them. Otherwise, it's simply, it's not any fun, right? That's the part of the fun, the lulls, so to speak, is, is getting someone to reply as much as possible and get worked up. So when you reply, it's important to understand that this, it's not a game that you can win. Right? The only winning move is to not play, to quote the seminal 1983 film War Games starring Matthew Broderick. Uh, <laughs> if you want to check that out, it's not that great. Uh, but, but you got to basically end of the bottom line, you got to understand the troll, the hater, they're not playing by any agreed upon sets of rules, right? This isn't a, a debate to them. This is, this is a street fight. And in fact, it's not even a street fight because at the end of the day, they don't even care about winning. Like they're not trying to win the argument. They just want to cause as much drama and as much pain as humanly possible. And I learned this lesson quite a few times in my, in my career, as it were, over the past 20 years. First, in real life, as I started to improve my social skills and become more outgoing and kind of started to bump up against people who didn't want me to maybe infiltrate their peer group and, and stuff like that. And then I experienced again online once I started to gain kind of more of a presence in that sphere. And then beyond that, once our business got bigger, we started to have to deal with problematic customers who were either trying to scam us or who were just, quite frankly, toxic, crazy people trying to vent their own misery onto other people. Having said all that, how do you deal with this? Well, here's a couple of guidelines that I live by that have helped me a great deal. Okay, number one, do not pay any more attention than is absolutely necessary to haters, to critics, to, to trolls, right? It's that old idea of the spectator versus the player, right? These people are like some neckbeard up in the stands talking bad about LeBron James. Like, oh, LeBron, he's nitpicking at a, he's a stat pad or whatever the case may be. Meanwhile, they're not capable of doing one one thousandth of what he's accomplished. In other words, why would I care about the opinion of somebody who's not taking as much action as I am? Now, in a social situation, if, and again, we're talking about people who are kind of maybe sniping off to the side, oh, look at this guy, <laughs> thinks he's so cool. <laughs> oh, you think you're cool, huh? Duh, 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 duh. Why don't you get out of here? You know, stuff like that. I'll literally just ignore these people, right? I'll give them the bare minimum so they're not like disrespect and, and can take it to anger. I, I don't give them a hook, in other words. I'll simply, like, they'll say it and I'll just be like, oh, that's awesome, dude. And then boom, and then just continue doing what I'm doing, right? And back in the day, I used to kind of Mickey Mouse around and I would try to out alpha them and stuff like that. We had developed all these various lines and gambits to do so. <laughs> Thinking back, some of them were quite funny and effective. And you know, I was pretty good at it too. But now I realize that anything that does not contribute directly to your process, and in this example, that process is trying to get to know somebody better while you know this tool off to the side is trying to derail it. Anything that does not contribute directly to that process of getting to know that person, it's just burning energy. Now, I think it is important to, to note that on occasion, these people can do things that force you to deal with them, right? You, you have to deal with them. You have to engage with them to an extent. Uh, in a business situation, sometimes you might get a toxic customer who just complains about every little minute detail and just wants to waste as much of your time as possible. 
if it's at all possible, don't deal with these people directly. You know, you want to hand them off to a dedicated customer support guy, and that person should be provided with you know uh, standard operating procedures for dealing with specific situations as they come up. And you know, if you're just starting your business, you're going to have to develop these SOPs over time. You know, as as these different situations pop up. But in most cases, though, you know, with these types of people, you don't, you certainly don't want to get into some protracted back and forth with them. The best thing to do in that case, honestly, is just apologize, refund them, and then blacklist them from ever dealing with you again. Like even if they are 100% in the wrong, it's just not worth your time. Now, now again, if someone does have a legitimate complaint, obviously you want to address it. You know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and get into some headspace where like, well, the customer is always wrong. You know, I, I, I've had a lot of friends who kind of get into that, I, I don't know, confrontational headspace. You know, it's an us versus them thing with their customers. And that, that's just cynical, just bitter. It's just not helpful. And, you know, there is a huge distinction between legitimate criticism and trolling. Like not every complaint is a troll thing about you. Uh, you know, not every, every criticism is trolling. Legitimate criticism from other people who actually wanted to help me, that's been a very powerful tool, a, a very big factor in my current success. You know, I, I, look, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I'm a human. A lot of times when someone gives a criticism, I feel that kind of little bristling up on the neck when, you know, someone dares to challenge what I believe to be the best course of action. But, you know, at the end of the day, I consider myself a pretty reasonable person. And after that initial kind of flush of indignation goes away, I'll hear, I'll hear them out. I'll hear what they're trying to say. And if it makes sense, I'll take it to heart. I'll take it on board and I'll apply it. In fact, some of my most loyal fans and, and repeat customers were very often people who initially hated me over something, you know, some kind of online thing. And it turned out just to be a miscommunication. And after I talked to this guy for a little bit, we saw eye to eye, you know, and, and they became, they got on board. You know, it's, it kind of reminds me of, you know, in the pub, you see a couple blokes who, ha, a couple of blokes who have a little, little punch up over some dumb shit. And then afterwards, it's like, all right, mate, let's get a beer together. And they become friends. I, I, I really love that about the the culture of the United Kingdom. You know, here we just, in America, we just shoot each other. But, <laughs> but yeah, so there isn't legit criticism, but trolls, if it's a troll, if, it's, if there's nothing legitimate about it, these should be identified and just summarily dismissed before they have the chance to get under your skin and trigger your, your, your Batman complex. You know, I must punish them so they don't do this again. I must show them the error of their ways. It's like, nah, dude, that's not your job. It, it's not your job. It's not worth your time. Now, socially, again, I just talked about a business situation, but socially, there's a couple examples of haters that you might deal with when you're out meeting people. And I call these snowflakes and untouchables, right, in your interactions. Now, this might, for lack of a better term, this might be the, the less attractive friend of somebody that you're trying to meet who seems to have a bit of a righteous indignation about you attempting to speak to their friend. Um, and, and again, I think these fall into kind of two broad categories. You've got snowflakes and you've got, again, untouchables. And the snowflakes, it, it's basically a person who doesn't have a lot of power in the situation, but they're kind of acting as a gatekeeper. And they, they, want, they want a little bit of special treatment in order to uh, you know, help you out. And honestly, the special treatment isn't that much. Like, let's say in a business setting, you know, you have the person that runs the records room, right? That's all they do. They just run the records room. However, in that domain, they are God, right? They are absolute God. And if you want to get your records, you have to bring them a donut or something like that, right? It's known. You got to, you got to, you got to pay the, pay the toll to get your records from, from the records room. Now, a lot of people will kind of take umbrage at that, or even like say a bartender, you know, a lot of, or a, or a waiter. Some people are like, you serve me. I don't need to talk to you. And a lot of times these people, you know, if you get some kind of prickly bartender at like a dive bar, a lot of times I, I just chat these people up, you know, we, you know, not, not like taking them away from their work, but like if they're in between, uh, you know, you know, chores or jobs, I can just, Hey, so how's it too, pretty busy for a Tuesday? Huh? I guess that's good for you though. Huh? So anyway, blah, 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 blah. You know, just a little bit of back and forth is all it takes to make them be like, okay, this guy's cool. Now, if we're talking about a situation where you're trying to meet someone and their friend is the so-called snowflake, a lot of times all it takes is just a, a slight acknowledgement, right? Oh, hi. Like 15% of the time you talk to them. 
it's that easy. It, it, it's that simple to kind of defuse. It's like, okay, they acknowledge me as a human being. They're, they don't just have these blinders on and they're just talking to the, the person they want to they talk to and ignoring me. It's like a lot of times if you just do 15% of your attention here, 80, 85% of your attention here, that's enough. And again, I, I notice a lot of people tend to get triggered by that, right? They're like, low status demanding special treatment? How dare you? How dare they, right? But ultimately, does it really cost you anything to talk to them, especially if it makes things go smoothly? You know, does it really cost you anything to bring a coffee for the, the janitor, to remember the bartender's name, to bring donuts for the security guy at your work? Snowflakes are usually only a problem if you're an asshole. But with these so-called untouchables, no matter what you do, they're gonna be a problem. Now with untouchables, this could be someone at work who just seems to be highly unpleasant. They, every time you approach them, they're just nasty. They don't, any sort of olive branch will be rejected. Uh, in a social situation, this might be just an extremely nasty, unpleasant person who no matter what you do, doesn't want you to you know, join their peer group, whatever. Um, they just feel that, I, I think that a lot of these people, they've just deliberately removed themselves from the tribe, so to speak, because they find the social politics, the, so the game, they find it stressful, or they doubt their ability to be good at it. So they're like, you know what, I'm just going to remove myself from the whole thing. And so basically their whole MO is to try to make you mad to drive you away. <clears throat> and they're basically what they're doing psychologically, they're, they're looking for hooks to justify their nasty behavior. Right. So they might say something like, what are you here to harass us? And in which case, I, I'm not even going to take the bait. I'll be like, harass you? I don't know. That sounds like a lot of work. I'm just here to enjoy my night. Or, I, you know, or I'm just here. I'm just trying to get the project done or whatever the case may be. So try as best you can to deal with them on that human neocortex level and take that whole limbic monkey brain game out of it. Right. Some people are just plain mean and they just wanna damage people around them. And these people, they cannot be dealt with and they should just be ignored, dismissed, or in the case of work fired, or if it's a customer blacklisted and just not dealt with again, if possible. Remember, the troll wants you to get out of your rational human brain and put you into that monkey dance where you're very worked up and you get all emotional. Because then it's very easy to manipulate you and get that, that dramatic response that they're looking for. So you wanna to try to take the high road or do what I call the big dog tactic, right? So think of a, an adult dog and there's like a little puppy dog that's trying to antagonize him, like nipping, nipping, nipping. The big dog won't even notice. Like it's literally below his notice and it'll just carry on as though nothing's happening. So I find with these, you know, these so-called untouchables, that's very often the best way to go about it. Now, my buddy Owen, he'll very often purposely engage with trolls on forums and stuff like that. However, understand he's doing this for a very specific reason. He's challenging himself to respond in that big dog manner, that unemotional manner, and treat the, the attacks or the insults as simply thoughtful questions to be answered, right? So again, with this approach, you're, you're not taking the bait. Remember, the hater wants to fight, so they're gonna throw out those hooks, hoping you take the bait. And the basic, progression is as follows, right? The motivation to act out comes first, right? They want to fight. Then they find the hook that gives them the justification for that. Then they do the behavior. So handle at the right level. It's very hard for somebody who's looking for hooks to keep going when the other person doesn't take the bait, right? If it's a social situation, like, what are you looking at? What are you harassing us? This, that, the next thing. If you don't, if you don't take the bait and fire back, if they push it too far, it can backfire on them because witnesses are gonna know, like the people around watching, they're like, oh, they'll know they're the one being the asshole. And at that point, you know, they'll likely walk away. They might mutter an insult, uh, you know, if it's some, some dude trying to, trying to get a rise out of you. And if they do that, still pretend not even to notice. Like you, you gotta resist that urge to get the last word in, you know, cause that monkey brain, it really, really wants to get that last word in. It really wants to win, right? Now, I, I, I want to reemphasize here that responding to trolls carries specific consequences and problems, okay? It, it's not enough to just say, don't do it. We've got to pinpoint why not. What, what's, the, what's the drawback to you? What, what is the cost of doing this? Well, first off, there's simply the opportunity cost of the mental capital that you're using to respond to them, 
right? Anytime you find yourself poised over the keyboard, ready to type out your scathing retort, just literally ask yourself, what else could I be focusing on? What else could you be focusing on and doing with that time, right? Because that's how they hit you. They monopolize your time, okay? Secondly, there's that, when you respond, you're giving an internal self-reinforcement of the underlying belief that you're insecure and that they struck a nerve with their comment. And this is implicit in needing to, feeling that strong need to directly respond to them. So the next time you feel that, again, that strong urge, oh, I gotta, I gotta respond to this, ask yourself, if you knew for a fact that in two years you would have $20 million and you'd have a perfect life, would you even care? Like literally, if, like ask yourself, if I knew in two years, I will have my perfect dream life, my dream spouse, my dream dog or whatever, my dream financial situation. Would I even give a shit about this? The answer is no, don't respond. You know, I remember these trolls used to get under my skin a lot around like 2008, once I started getting, you know, kind of a bigger online presence and so forth. And, and we, we got our own forums going. I noticed a lot of time, the, the troll attacks were really ramping up. And a lot of these people were super nasty and they'd make like photoshops of, of me and stuff, which were actually quite funny in many cases. But I, I noticed it getting to me. So I'm like, I need to understand the psychology of trolls. So I basically went to where trolls are born and it's the asshole of the internet, 4chan forward slash B. And I spent about 18 months participating on B in, uh, you know, anonymously as, as everyone is on there. And it, quite frankly, it probably did me more psychological harm than good. <laughs> and I wouldn't do it again. Uh, but I do understand the psychology of trolls very, very deeply, right? It's all about the lulls, okay? It's about, again, milking the lulls cow for everything that they can get. As long as they keep responding, there's more lulls to be had and the game is not over until all lulls have been harvested. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you go on 4chan. It's probably best for you to not do that. However, if you do want to get a little insight into the psychology of trolls, around that same time, I think 09, there was a New York Times article on trolls. I forget the exact uh, headline. You could just search that and you could find it. Uh, but basically this reporter, he, he or she, I forget who, he decided to dive deep and meet a bunch of famous trolls who did a lot of horrible things like, you know, teased people online until they committed suicide and then teased the family with, with photoshops and, or posted like uh, flashing gifts that would give people epilepsy, epileptic fits and stuff like that. So, you know, some really nasty stuff. So this reporter sought them out. So the reporter's sitting in a diner with this troll and out of, out of the blue, the troll says to the reporter, you have green hair. Did you know that? And the reporter's like, no. And the troll says, why not? And the reporter says, well, I, cause I look in the mirror and I see that my hair is black. And the troll replies, oh, that's very interesting. I guess you understand you have green hair about as well as you understand that you're a terrible reporter. And the reporter replies like, what, what do you mean? What did I do? And the troll's like, that's a very interesting reaction. Why didn't you get so defensive when I said you had green hair? In other words, if the reporter was certain that he wasn't a bad reporter, he would have just laughed it off in the same way that he laughed off the green hair comment. So again, the underlying takeaway here is you only care if on a certain level you believe what they're saying. So when I'd get these comments in the forum and they'd say things like, you know, Jeff sucks at coaching. He doesn't care about his students. He's not getting good results. I thought about it. I'm like, well, I know that's blatantly untrue. So why get worked up about it? So you got to be able to reframe these hater attacks on your self-worth in order to avoid getting pushed into that so-called monkey brain where you can't think straight and you just want revenge on the person that done you wrong. So you've got to consider that. And then also on the flip side, you got to consider the source. You know, one of the greatest things I ever did was to actually meet some of these trolls in real life at events and stuff like that. Uh, or occasionally, you know, even today we'll be on Instagram live and you'll get someone in the chat who's you know, just saying a bunch of nonsense, causing a ruckus, trying to provoke. And we'll invite these people on with us. Like, okay, unmute and come on and let's have a talk. And 99 times out of 100, these people look and talk exactly how you would imagine a, a stereotypical basement dweller to, to appear and talk, right? And it's only the anonymity of the internet that gives them the balls really to, to behave and speak in this way to people. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. A second like cost or consequence of feeding the trolls 
is this. The extra attention that you give the troll kind of makes people believe it's true, right? Like, oh, well, if it was important enough for him to respond to, it, there must be an element of truth to it. So that person, the troll, they go from looking like a kook to looking somewhat legitimate. In other words, you actually legitimize them by responding in some cases. And beyond that, responding shows them that you respond. They're like, oh, this guy responds. And once they see that, boom, they just pile on. And inevitably, they're going to take your responses out of context or they're gonna simply dig up more stuff. And then it's this cycle where you're forced to respond and respond and respond and respond, which incentivizes them to keep doing it more. And then at some point, if you stop responding and you cut the cycle off, it almost looks like that particular criticism where you stopped responding was true. Well, that's why he stopped talking. He left because he knew this was true. So that's what not to do, okay? So you might be asking, well, Jeff, what should I do when I encounter these so-called haters? A much better strategy is to be proactive as opposed to reactive, right? Rather than, again, get involved in this response cycle where you're just burning mental capital, use that opportunity cost of mental capital, time capital, emotional capital to just go out and do such great work that the work speaks for itself. And then beyond that, if there's specific criticisms of you, simply do a proactive thing in your work that covers that. Remember, trolls put themselves in a weak position inherently because it's easy to disprove their lie via your work. If you just produce, it shuts them up. You know, an example of this from back in the day was when uh, I remember the author Tucker Max was talking badly about our organization. He's like, okay, these guys, they can go approach and meet people randomly in a bar, but they can't just, they couldn't just go and have fun at a park and meet people passively while they're going about their lives and having fun. So what happened almost immediately, myself and Tyler, we went to Dolores Park here in San Francisco and we simply made a super dope video showing us doing exactly that back in 2014. And we had that up within a week, right? So it was proactive and not reactive of like, well, no, we're not like that. We, you know, again, talk is cheap, right? So we put out something of value at, at bare minimum and we didn't feed the trolls, right? So the key was we used it as fuel to go out and create something super cool. Right? And you can draw from this, again, just on a smaller level, you could be like in the gym and you could be like, these people, they're talking trash and you can kind of use that as fuel to push yourself further. If you've seen the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, Michael Jordan used to do this stuff all the time. He'd make up little narratives in his head about like personal vendettas to create that energy and fuel to win. I remember in one of the, um, one of the episodes, he walks by the opposing coach and who, who he knew very well, and the coach didn't acknowledge him, right? Didn't look up and say, hey, Mike, right? And he's like, I took it personal. And, and it's like, that's all I needed. And then he just took that to win, right? So again, rather than be reactive, maybe use it as fuel and, and proactively create work that disproves the lie. And of course, it's not like the trolls are ever gonna, you know, apologize, oh, I was wrong. Like, they're never gonna cop to it when you do it but they inevitably will look super dumb, which is nice. And that brings us to the final tip. A lot of the time, even despite your best efforts and, and your, your knowledge that it isn't a good idea to respond to the trolls, regardless, you're very often gonna feel a very strong desire to engage with them regardless, okay? I mean, I still do, even to this day, like I still see, like sometimes on occasion, I'll see something, I'll be like, you know, on Facebook, some, some post I don't like or something like, I want it, but let's like, dude, no. Again, again, you got to learn to understand that it's a powerful knee-jerk reaction and then still not allow it. Again, remember that old Mark Twain quote, never argue with a fool because onlookers might not be able to tell the difference. And remember, these people, these trolls, they very often just can't help themselves. Honestly, most of the time when I meet these people or encounter, or encounter them today, I honestly... I don't even feel mad at them, right? I feel compassionate toward them because, you know, the so-called basement dweller leaving rude comments on your Yelp page for your business or, you know, that obnoxious, just frankly unattractive person who's trying to ruin your social interactions at a party. These aren't happy people. They feel like life's dealt them a bad hand for whatever reason and they're just lashing out, you know? I've seen it a million times and perhaps more importantly, I was there once as well. And again, you can feel compassionate towards them, like, man, that sucks to be them, but 
ultimately you can't change them because they're not arguing in good faith, right? So again, you can't help them. Don't try to wait, again, don't waste time trying to help them, but don't harbor resentment towards them either because their life is its own punishment, so to speak, right? When you're staying on your path, when you're living up to your own values and your code of conduct and you're enjoying success, don't pay any attention to what these haters and, and quite frankly, these spectators are yelling at you from the sidelines because these people, they'd never actually buy anything from you or they'd never actually become your actual friend in a million years anyway. So stop trying to make everyone like you and focus on the people that your approach actually resonates with. I'm not looking, when I go out, I'm not looking for 10 people that think I'm kinda okay, right? I'm trying to find those clients, those romantic partners, those friends who think, this guy is amazing, I love this dude, and I wanna form relationships with those people. Because those are the people who are gonna be your true, satisfied, loyal, lifelong fans, and that's more than gonna make up for any slight irritation caused by these trolls and haters. Now, a lot of this stuff is just awareness of basic human psychology, along with an understanding of the techniques surrounding conflict communication. And this, the tips I've given in this video are quite frankly just the tip of the iceberg. And once you know how to navigate this stuff, uncomfortable discussions or confrontational situations that you might've avoided in the past, you start to view those opportunities for growth and success. And I've studied this for many years, almost 20 years, and I've become extremely good at teaching this kind of communication. And I can train you personally so you'll never be susceptible to these kind of psychological attacks again, whether it's some troll on the internet or some rando trying to derail your interaction at a party. So hit the link in the description below if you wanna personally train with me and we can get the ball rolling on that. All right, it's your boy Jeffy. Until next time, peace. Definitely learned a lot just to be able to connect with people a lot better. Jeffy's really studied down to the roots of how we're so stifled and you have these entanglements inside you and how to release them. I definitely recommend this program for other people to like take a deeper look within themselves. Jeffy's program is amazing. This program is extremely exercise based. It's designed to give you a process to identify these weaknesses in your communicative system to open and sustain charismatic expression and charismatic communication with increasing consistency. All sensory communication is based on some relationship of these three perceptual and projected modes. Any art involving human communication is gonna benefit from knowing how the communicating power of each mode can be enhanced. Charisma and conversational skill really hasn't had a vocabulary for talking about these issues surrounding the technique. Most of the books you read, the vast majority of them are very like surface level, very hokey. And even with experienced teachers, the feedback can often be very subjective and vague. You seem kind of stifled. So I wanna change the way that these criticisms or descriptions are verbalized and get very, very specific. So when we're talking about these blockages, we know precisely what we're talking about here. If you follow the instructions, you see something very, uh, very net and precise that happens. You're gonna see the result instantaneously. It's the best uh, charisma program I've ever seen. So I actually, I learned something which is very rare. How do people use their energies when they communicate? How can I help them become masters of those energies? So when you go out and you feel that blockage, that inability to act, oh, there's the person I wanna to talk to, I know how to go talk to them, I've read the theories, I've watched all the videos, but I can't take action. What's impeding the flow? Remove the obstacles, isolate the skills, exercise them separately, then put them together, back together in a more completely realized whole. You know, unleashes your, your true charisma. And in fact, you have some glimpse of energy. You can manage on the, on the world side, increase it, decrease it, manage it. Seriously, it was absolutely amazing and astonishing. How to speak to all the issues surrounding this inner relationship between intuitive and intellectual resources is arguably the most fundamental challenge facing anyone who's attempting to improve their communication skills. So this program intends to prepare your total instrument to open and communicate freely, but also teach you to let go. He will take you by the hand and guide you step by step with his method that he's been trying and improving, and you're gonna get the results that you wanna be looking for. Overall, this is a really broad spectrum course in charisma. I think I can apply it in my dating life, also in business and other areas of my life. So if you're looking to develop general charisma that you can apply across all areas of life, definitely check out Jeff's Charisma Mastery.